Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Bacchus Uncorked program, Drinking and Thinking. Yes, that is the program. Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism. Uh, I'm Kenneth Lapotten, Curator of Antiquities here at the Getty Villa, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the program. These Bacchus Uncorked wine programs explore art, wine, and the culture of the ancient world. And our event today is generously supported by the Getty Villa Council, for which we are very grateful, and um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of council members here today. Our theme is inspired by the gold portrait bust of Marcus Aurelius, which is the star of our exhibition, The Gold Emperor from Aventicum. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was not only emperor of the Roman world, but also a Stoic philosopher who wrote down his thoughts about leading a just life. And his book titled The Meditations survives and is still widely read. Our first uh, special guest is Dr. Denis Genequin, director of the Archaeological Research Center and Roman Museum in Avanche, Switzerland where the gold bust of Marcus Aurelius was discovered and usually lives. Dr. Genequin will briefly introduce the bust and its ancient context. After Dr. Genequin, our main event will be philosopher Barry C. Smith, director of the Institute of Philosophy at the University of London School for Advanced Study. He is the founding director there of the Center for the Study of the Senses which pioneers collaborative links between philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists. He is a philosopher of mind and language, and his current research is on the multisensory interactions between flavor, taste, and smell. Barry's a frequent contributor to the world of wine, and in 2009 published a book entitled Questions of Taste, the philosophy of wine. And imagine the rigorous research that went into that. <laughs> Our third speaker will be familiar to any of you who have been to a previous Bacchus Uncorked. Diego Medavia is president and director of education of the North American Sommelier Association. In 2008, he obtained the gold pin certificate of the Italian Sommelier Association and the Worldwide Sommelier Association. He's a certified master taster and specialist of wine with the Society of Wine Educators uh, in the United States. He is a native Italian, and he is passionate about the archaeology and ancient European history with a focus on his native lands, Celtic, which means Gallic heritage. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Genequin to the podium then we'll have, without any interruption, Professor Smith and then uh, Dr. Meravilla. Please welcome them all to the Getty Villa. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to introduce this uh, this event now with a few words about the discovery of the golden bust in Avanche, Aventic, ancient Aventicum, and the, to, to give you also a few words about the history of this site. Avanche is the largest archaeological site in Switzerland. It's situated roughly in the middle of the Swiss plateau, and it has been the object of, of archaeological research since the 17th century. Uh, all this provided us with a huge array of information about the, the site, and we are able now to, to reconstruct it as follows. As a very large Roman city, which arrived in the, between the first and the third century AD, the plan of which is really well known now, with the city, with the, the city itself, with the living quarters, the forum in the center, and a number of large monuments, religious and also amphitheater, theater. All these monuments were excavated since, I say, the, um, the, the second half of the 19th century. 
1938, between 1938 and 1940, a very large excavation was launched in one of the sanctuary of the, the city, the sanctuary of the, the, the Sigonier. Uh, this was led by the archaeologist Louis Bosset, and it was originally organized as a program to provide employment for jobless people at the end of the 30s. Uh, they employed a huge amount of workers and started excavating this sanctuary, the one that is working very well. Here is the, the sanctuary with a temple in the center and a courtyard with portico uh, on the side. It's a building that is over 100 meters wide, uh, quite impressive. And architecturally, it's very similar, inspired from the Forum Pakis in Rome that was um, uh, built by Emperor Vespasian in the early 70s. During the course of this excavation on the, uh, on the 20th of April, 1939, an extraordinary discovery was done. And it was during the clearing, the excavation of an underground water channel, a sewage pipe, uh, that was crossing all the courtyard of the sanctuary, that you can see also on this slide, that the workers found the golden bust of Marcus Aurelius. This bust is the one that is on display in the Getty Villa since the, the month of May. It's one of the very few occasions to see the, the original of the, of the bust in an exhibition out of Switzerland. Uh, it, has been only, it has been on display only five times out of Switzerland. This is the sixth time, and it's the first time that it's crossing the, the ocean. We're going, coming to, um, to the American continent. The gold bust is a rather large piece of, uh, uh, of um, uh, ancient art. It's 35 centimeters high, and it's made of a single sheet of gold, 22 carat gold, that has been worked in repoussé, and it weighs uh, uh, 1 kilo 589 grams. That is 3.5 uh, there has been some debate on the identification of the, the emperor. Of course, it is an emperor because it is gold. Uh, at the time of the discovery, they, they thought it could be uh, Antin Antoninus Pius. Or later on in the 70s, uh, another scholar proposed it might be Julian the Apostate. But all the studies that have been done, the comparison with other portraits, especially on the coins, tend to show that it is Marcus Aurelius, and that's the, the commonly uh, admitted identification for now. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, and uh, welcome to Bacchus Uncorked. It's a huge pleasure for me to join you again. Uh, I've been here previously on these occasions and talking about other schools of philosophy, and, and if you don't mind, I'm going to try to allude to them, but I will make sure I include everybody, whether they were here last time or not. Now, we're going to talk about Marcus Aurelius in honor of the bust, which we're able to see upstairs. And we're talking about his contribution to Stoic philosophy. And pretty much, it's the contribution to a practical philosophy, how we should live, how we should conduct our lives. But I want to suggest that in many ways, talking about Marcus Aurelius and talking about Stoicism is a little ironic. Indeed, there are sort of tensions between that and the whole purpose of the occasion. But those tensions are in Marcus's life as well. The idea of working on Stoicism and then going straight to wine when we know that Stoicism is a, a recommendation to avoid being dominated by pleasure or giving into the body or contenting oneself with, with too much of anything uh, seems a little strained. But I'm going to suggest to you by the end, not as, not as strained as we think. But another tension with 
Marcus Aurelius and his, his position as a Stoic philosopher is he's committed to the idea that we should live our lives according to philosophical principles. And it's the kind of philosophy that requires us to contemplate, to have stillness inside, to live according to the, the contemplation and equanimity of the mind. Now, it's very hard to remember that as you read through his work, when you also have it in mind that he was, of course, an emperor, an emperor of almost all of the known world at the time. He was engaged in military campaigns and battles against the uh, uh, Parthians and against the Germanic barbarians, but, but there he was recommending us to say nothing Nothing that happens in, in our lives, any event, we shouldn't take it too seriously, we shouldn't let it dominate us. We should let our fates determine how our life will be lived and it's up to us to, to bear our fate and to accept it well. Now it might seem it's easier to accept your fate if you're the emperor of Rome <laughs> and the, <laughs> the known leader of almost everything you survey. But he was one of the so-called five good emperors and to put them in order, uh, we have Nerva, and then we have um, Trajan of column fame, and then we had Hadrian of wall fame, and then we had uh, Antoninus, uh, also of a smaller wall, more farther north in, in, in the British Isles and well into Scotland. But what's interesting about the five emperors, and maybe something that was responsible for them becoming good and just emperors, was the way in which each of them inherited their position. Because uh, Marcus Aurelius was the adopted heir of Antoninus, not his own child, his own son, but, but someone he adopted and, 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 and put in place to be emperor. And Antoninus had had this fate conferred on him by Hadrian, who in turn had been the adopted heir of Trajan. And so in some sense, each of them was there on merit or was chosen to fulfill that fate. And again, one of the tensions we see in Marcus Aurelius's life and in his Stoic philosophy is that he didn't follow this tradition. And perhaps he should have because his son was put on the throne after him and was Commodus. <laughs> and Commodus is so famously a bad emperor that he has the supreme fate of being the denouement of gladiator and killed by Russell Crowe. <laughs> so, so a really bad emperor. Uh, but, but let's go back to the man we're here to talk about and whose life and whose thoughts and writings we're here to celebrate. So these writings and these thinkings and this contribution to, to Stoic philosophy come to us from what we now call the meditations, but, but which were really jottings and writings that, that Marcus just called to himself. And when he wrote down notes in the evening, probably after being in campaigning battles, their admonitions, their uh, little aperçu, little aphorisms, things that try to remind him how to behave, how to be well, uh, ordered in mind, how to accept his fate and how not to take anything too seriously because everything, according to the Stoic philosophy, was going to pass and change, and any moment was no more important than the moments that would still come and the moments that had receded and were now in the past. And in fact, the Stoics thought we had to live every moment in the only moment we could occupy, which was the present, and we had to take it as no more important than all the moments of the present that would fill up eternity. So it was a it was a philosophy of letting things go and allowing things to be as they were and to deal with that, to be able to uh, accept that, accept your fate. And of course, the gold bust is on this front cover of a very old Penguin Classics uh, book, which uh, was my copy of the meditations, which I had since I was a, a schoolboy and young student with its yellowed pages and and I have to tell you that I left it on the plane coming from London to Los Angeles. But you say, oh, but having just read and reread Marcus on Stoic <laughs> philosophy, I thought I mustn't, I mustn't let this trouble me. I must let this go. 
if I hadn't been reading and rereading the thoughts of Marcus Aurelius, I might have been much more perturbed by this. I'll let it go. <laughs> now, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so there I was doing a practical exercise, unbeknownst to me, but one that was thrust on me by fate, I like to say. Now, Stoicism is one of those Roman schools along with Epicureanism, Cynicism, Skepticism. And uh, it borrows a little bit from Epicureanism, although it, it rejects the idea of uh, indulging oneself in sensory pleasures and experience, and it, it rejects some of the metaphysical thinking behind uh, Epicureanism, and we'll get to that because that's terribly important about why Stoicism ends up being a practical guide to life and a guide to accepting one's fate. Now, when we look at Stoicism, we can look at it as a set of philosophical uh, ideas, ideas in physics, ideas in logic, ideas in metaphysics, but, but principally ideas in ethics. But quite often, ideas in ethics are principles or recommendations or grand theses about what is morally good or right or what we ought to do. But instead, in, in especially in Marcus Aurelius, we have in Marcus recommendations of how to live, how to be, how to content oneself with the life of the mind and how to live a well-ordered and measured uh, mental life. So it's much more about a, a, a therapeutic way to conduct moment-to-moment -moment life rather than a grand philosophical theorizing about what is right. Now, Marcus plays a role in a, in a line of three important Stoics and three important contributors to this school of philosophy. And the first of these is Seneca, who was not only a philosopher, but also a playwright. He wrote some very powerful and dramatic, seven, I think, tragedies, some of which reappear in their theme in Shakespeare plays. But, but Seneca says this, we suffer more in the imagination than in reality. And you might think, well, what does he mean by that? And especially as somebody who writes plays and who's uh, consumed with ideas of the imagination, other of those tensions. But I think the idea is following on from something that we got from Epicurus, where Epicurus says this, the things you really need are few and easy to come by, but the things you can imagine you need are infinite and you will never be satisfied. So again, it's about recommending being contented with one's lot. Now another philosopher following on from Seneca who contributed a great deal of the theorizing, a great deal of the philosophical underpinnings of Stoicism is Epictetus. Now, Epictetus influences the following saying of Marcus Aurelius, but it's only when we realize what the philosophical theory of Epictetus is and was that I think we'll understand this in full. So here's the, here's the thing that is really got from Epictetus, but that Marcus very much appreciated. He is a wise man who does not grieve for the things he does not have, but rejoices for those which he has. Now, why is that? What, what does Epictetus have to do with this? Well, Epictetus says this, what then is to be done? How should one act? To make the best of what is in our power and take the rest as it naturally happens. So there's a contrast between what's in our power and what naturally happens. And that contrast falls nicely between the soul and the body or the mind and the body. So the idea is that the body as part of nature will be subject to nature's laws and will be subject to the ways in which the world of natural causes will move things along. And we have no way to intervene in that. But our minds, our minds, we do have power over and we have the power of reason. And that's somewhere where we can exercise that little bit of judgment. Now here we have one of the, the major differences between the uh, Epicurean school of philosophy and the Stoic school of philosophy, and it's this. You could either think, as Epicurus did, that everything in nature was just atoms in the void. It was just the collision of meaningless atoms. There was nothing there. Or you could think that nature was 
providentially ordered by the gods, was put in train and given its shape and its purpose and its, its, its drive and its direction by the influence of the gods. And Marcus thinks it has to be the latter. And it has to be the latter because he finds it so implausible, so ridiculous that we should just be part of atoms floating in the void. Why would we care? Why would it matter? Why would we see some things working out well or going well? How could we understand fate if that's all there was? So for, for Marcus Aurelius, being part of nature means we're part of an ordered universe that's not ordered by us, but it's ordered by divine fate or providence. It's ordered by the gods. There's not much we can do. So then what of free will? Have we got any? Well, in some sense, we haven't, because in some sense, you came here today and you'll drink wine, I hope, and leave this evening, and that'll be just how it goes. That'll be just the course of action that your bodily nature moves and, and, and causes you to do, and all of the things that happen, the collisions you have with uh, social collisions, I mean with one another and, and meeting people and bumping into them and saying hello and moving around, all of that will be ordered by the fates. So where is there any room for things to be free? Because after all, if everything is determined already in advance, what you're going to do, what's going to happen next, could you really have done otherwise? Do you really have any choice? If it's all determined, if it's all laid out, then what will happen to the course of your body in the next hour or two is really not up to you. So where then is free will for the Stoics? Well, there's that little wriggle room inside. There's that little bit that's left over in the mind. And here is the way in which we're resolving one of those tensions between everything being determined, everything being providentially ordered, and us being, as it were, just mere movers in the great scheme of fate. And then this bit of freedom that we have in our own minds internally to decide whether to accept our fate or, as it were, in a futile way, try to resist it or rail against it or complain about it. And now you begin to see why it's part of stoicism to, to be able to bear and endure and accept what comes your way. Deal with it might be the take home message of the Stoics. But deal with it well. Deal with it without getting unnecessarily irked and irritated. Try to have equanimity. Try to have an acceptance of how things are. So you can decide when things happen to you, do I accept them or do I resist them? And sometimes by accepting them, by coming to understand that they're providentially arranged and ordered, you can be contented with them. So thought Marcus and he recommends to himself to do this. So here we have this strange position, a deterministic universe of body but freedom of mind to accept fate. I think that's, uh, again, a considerable tension because the idea that uh, we're, we're observing ourselves and deciding whether we're, we're good with what's happening or we're not, and, and Marcus is giving us a series of notes and lectures and lessons in each of the books on how to, how to accept what comes up, how to accept what happens. That's a, that's a curious position to be in, but then again, it is supposed to bring you peace of mind, supposed to stop you worrying about the things you can't worry about. He says at one point, never complain again about the, um, you know, the, the, the boredom and the irritation of the council meetings. So try and say that to yourself on Monday morning. Never complain about your, <laughs> the boring irritation of other people. Just ex that's how it is. Accept it if you, can, if you can bear that. So now that we've got that idea of deterministic universe, how do we internally view it and accept it? Then we can see why Seneca says this. Don't try to arrange what is up to fortune while neglecting what is up to us. So you could be trying to resist and trying to complain and trying to force and arrange things to happen while taking your eye off the duty and the work that you have to put in to, to accept and to come to terms with or to think in the right way about or reason in the right way about what's going on in you and what's happening in you. And again, again, we've got another of those tensions which I think are so characteristic of 
Marcus Aurelius and his, his life and his thinking. Because although this is a doctrine of accept, be at peace, don't fight against fate, don't struggle against fortune, it's a very demanding philosophy. It's very hard to do. I mean, this is something which Marcus is continually struggling with. As you read through the meditations, you'll realize that this is something which he is always on guard for. And he says, we have to be on guard. We have to make sure that we don't fall back into our old ways. We don't fall back into the, the lazy habits of bad thinking. We don't give up reason. We don't let our passions and emotions overtake us. So it's a very, very, very demanding philosophy. It's a philosophy where if you succeed in occupying the state that's recommended, it's a state of simplicity, but it demands nothing less than everything. It's a constant vigil that you have with yourself and your internal struggle. So this is why he says, he is a wise man who does not grieve for the things he has not, but rejoices with those he has. Look at the things that are happening to you. Look at the things that you're having now. So as I think to myself, should I let the loss of that, that copy, my copy of the meditations, should I let it gnaw at me? Is it going to be like a wound that nips in winter and I'll think about it uh, from time to time and miss it? Or should I, since I have no power over that probably, because I very much doubt whether LAX has preserved it carefully for me. Uh, it's bad enough trying to get your laptop back, which I have left on planes before. But um, I, I do think that he's, he's saying instead, look, I'm here, I'm talking to you. I'm having this wonderful opportunity to share with you and talk to you and discuss with you later these thoughts. I'm, I have the opportunity to see the, the, the bust of Marcus Aurelius that's come from Avanche and is very seldom on display. So I rejoice at that. I should take my pleasure in that and not be distracted by other things. So here we have an emperor who is also trying to tell us nothing much matters. Live in the moment. Don't, don't try to chase or seek or or attract the, the, the approbation and approval of others. It's not important, it's not worth anything, but he's also the most import, important man on earth at the time, this strange thing. But the one thing that he does concern himself with again and again is death. He's very preoccupied with death and you see him wrestling and trying to come to terms with it and trying to struggle with it. And he often says, you know, if, if things are annoying you or if someone is annoying you and causing you a great deal of irritation, remember they'll soon be dead. <laughs> and, if, and if that doesn't work, you might say, well, remember you'll soon be dead and that's supposed to be somewhat comforting. So, you know, this is, this, is, this is on his mind. Now, it may also be on his mind because at least four of his children died. He had five children, four of his children died and he watched that. It may also be the explanation of why he takes the wrong decision and puts Commodus on the throne instead of adopting someone else. So he's, he's preoccupied. And although he disagrees with the Epicureans about a lot of the ways to live and the things that matter in life, the senses and the experiences and the pleasures, he's very grateful to the Epicureans and he notes them for their way of thinking of death. And here's this quote that, that uh, he much admires from, uh, from Epicurus. <clears throat> death, therefore, the most awful of evils is nothing to us, seeing that when we are, death is not come. And when death is come, we are not. This thought can be put much more pithily and was by Ludwig Wittgenstein in uh, Tractatus uh, uh, Logico Philosophicus, where he says, death is not an experience in life. So it's not something that we shouldn't fear death. We might fear dying, but we shouldn't fear death because we're not going to be there to experience it. And this was a comfort to, uh, to Marcus. Marcus thought of that as one of the most important things. But he, he talks again and again. He's thinking about death again and again. Now, um, he even tries this. He says, I want you all to try. Imagine this is your last day. Imagine that you're going to die. You're going to have this wonderful wine tasting. You're going to go home and in your bed asleep, you're going to die. Well, it's quite likely. It's most likely. In fact, it's about 99% likely 
that you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, I didn't die. And he said, well, then regard every moment since then as a gift. Just think, you, it could have been your last day, it's not. So each day that comes, take it. Pay attention to it. Enjoy and experience it. So this is <coughs> Marcus coming up with uh, a very demanding philosophy, which, which he calls the art of living or the way of living, uh, which is a kind of self-mastery. How do you banish those dark thoughts? How do you avoid them? What do you, how should you counsel yourself not to be in the position to be constantly fearing or be distracted by things you can't change? But here are some of the things he said. He said, very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. You have control over your mind, not external events. When you realize this, you'll find strength. It's a kind of peace, it's a kind of freedom to realize the only thing you can affect is how you think about what happened. If something happens that seems terrible or insulting or makes you angry, he said, you're, you're losing control of yourself when you give in to that. But if you note that that's what's happening, you have some room to stand back and that you have control over. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. That's true. As you live your life, you know, if you, if you dwell on things, if you worry away at them, if you let anxious thoughts drive you, if you're consumed by that restless internal monologue, that's not good quality of thought and that's not going to give you a happy life. So this is, the art of living is the art of self-mastery, having power over that bit of you which you have power over, which you can do something about. And he says, remember, the soul becomes dyed with the color of its thoughts. If you harbor dark thoughts, you're going to have a, a darkness and a shadow that will hang over your life. Don't do that, he wants to say. So here's the simple way of summing it up. Again, remember, simply put, very difficult to do, right? But simply put, it's this. If it's not right, do not do it. If it's not true, do not say it. Okay, very simple precepts, but ones that take a lot to live up to. And he knows they take a lot to live up to because he says, for shame that ignorance and vanity should prove stronger than wisdom. And we only have to look at our current state of the world and our political leaders to realize that that might often be true. So here is, a, here is the person who was ruling as emperor the Roman world that occupied so much of Europe and so much of the world, but having this humility, this drive for equanimity, really extraordinary. And I want to finish by connecting the Stoics to uh, emotion, because I think you, quite often there's a, there's a cartoon version of Stoicism which says, don't have emotions, you know, try to calm them down, keep everything at bay, keep yourself in this wonderful, you know, equanimity, state of equanimity, uh, kind of, you know, like, like the best therapist advice, you know, hey, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm doing well. It's not like that. So there's a complexity that, that the Stoics uncover in emotion, which says emotion isn't a single thing. It's not just, oh, now I feel angrier. Wow, I'm overjoyed or ah, I'm a little bit anxious or afraid. It's not a single simple thing. There's a complexity, a hidden complexity to emotions. And it's that you first have what we might call the upheavals of the body. We have the feelings, we have the, you know, the, 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 the stiffening of the musculoskeletal structure, that little rising of, of the heart rate, that, that kind of flushing in the face, which would be the impressions of anger. And then the second part is, do I accept that or not? Do I want to go with that? Do I think it's justified? So the, the emotion for the Stoics isn't the mere affect, the feeling. The emotion is the totality of having a reasonable impression about what's happening in you and deciding to accept it or not. So it's a very complex thing, the emotion for Stoics. And that leads me nicely to wine. <laughs> how, you say, how? Well, because there's also something interesting about what we've just said about emotions when it comes to wine tasting. 
Because although Marcus certainly did drink and the Stoics certainly did drink, they didn't want to drink to excess. They didn't want to get consumed by the pleasures. They didn't want the pleasures to dominate them. But they would have been perfectly happy with Diego, who's going to follow me, and his practice of tasting and attending to wines. So the idea would be there's a difference between just drinking and tasting. And I think it's nicely summed up by Marcus in this quote. Nothing so enhances the mind as the ability to explore methodically and accurately every one of life's experiences in an effort to determine its classification. So the idea would be that when you're going to take a wine and you have a wine in front of you, it's not just about pleasing the body, it's not just about giving you pleasure, it's not just about indulging yourself, it's going to be about noting something, paying attention to it, having the impressions, which will be there, the first impressions, but then having your reflections on them, having your thoughts about them, having the ways in which you accept or don't accept it. And I think, and I think Diego and I are on a common mind on this one, that it's terribly important. When a winemaker has spent a year, he or she, making choices in the vineyard, in the winery, putting together a wine, putting it into barrel, putting it into bottle, keeping it in whatever way they think is going to produce the best of that wine. If you then turn up and taste their wine and you behave like a, a bad Roman emperor and you either give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down, you just say, oh, I like that, oh, I don't like that. That's a terrible thing to do. That's a year's work, that's a lot of effort. So instead, the idea is you pay attention, you taste the wine, you get those immediate impressions, which will include pleasure or something else, and, and you, you think about it. You think and decide about the experience. And maybe we can even put it as Marcus Aurelius might have put it. If you don't like it, then just accept you can't do anything about it and it'll soon be over. <laughs> and with that, I'll leave you. Thank you very much. The next presentation needs to come. Thank you very much, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Getty. It's, thanks to all the staff for having me here again. It's great to be reunited again, Professor Smith. So I've always been a, uh, a fan of Stoicism. I've always been an admirer of Stoicism, but for some reason I find myself far more akin to Epicureanism. I wa <laughs> wonder, I wonder why. Although, although, when things do happen to me, I do deal with them with a good drink. Right? So I guess there's some connection there. Let's quickly do an overview of what would have been wine in Roman times and how it changed throughout the expansion of the empire, arriving at 180, uh, the year 180, when uh, it was the height of Marcus Aurelius's empire. So back in uh, Roman times, wines would have been enjoyed in a way that is not common for us today. They were very often spiced. They were very often diluted with seawater, even. Uh, garum, which was a uh, fish sauce at the time, that some people liked their wines like that. I don't know if you want to put fish sauce in your wine today, but it was done back then. Or they were sweetened with honey. Uh, very, very common. So it was somewhat, the basis was the wine, but it was altered to the preference of the individual. That was something very, very common back then. But the Romans, the ancient Romans, did have a very specific category of wines that they would drink, that they would purchase, that they would trade in. And we found evidence of this in Pompeii. We find evidence of this throughout the villas uh, in, in central Italy, around the Roman, the ancient Roman Empire, the original ones, so the oldest parts. We have menus even that were found um, that in, uh, in the walls of, of certain wine bars in Pompeii, where we see the categories dulce, sweet, suave, gentle, light, firmum, strong, austere, Right, leno, so round, thick, seductive, and fugens, so ether ethereal, complex. So these were categories, so how wines tasted. Uh, and what made wines taste like that would have been the grapes that they were made from, the areas that they came from, so where the vineyards were, and so on and so forth. So there was a very clear and conscious knowledge of wine typologies and how to sell them and enjoy them. 
in, in ancient Roman times. Most of the wines that would have come from the ancient Roman uh, Empire, or at least from around the capital of Rome, which is situated right here, would have been all these ancient vineyards that are somewhat can be, they can somewhat be defined as ancient appellations or ancient denominations of wine. One that stands out right away that many of you probably know have heard before is the uh, Falernum, right? Where is it right there? Somewhere, somewhere right there. But Falernum, which was an ancient, uh, famous wine uh, in, in, in Roman times, was a specific vineyard coming, near, coming from near the town of, of Neapolis or Naples. Uh, it would have been down in southern Italy. So the majority of wine in ancient Roman times would have had origin in central to southern Italy, focused in, from vineyards around the volcanic areas. This is a map of Italy, and you can see in yellow and red uh, the most active volcanoes uh, that we have in southern Italy. So the Romans knew that that terroir, let's use this French word, so that environment, those soils of volcanic origin, growing grapes of a peculiar quality, or at least that had somewhat more complexity and character that was enjoyed and was loved uh, back in those days. Indeed, we shall see very shortly how a wine near uh, the volcano of Etna called Mamertino is the only wine mentioned in Julius Caesar's De Bello Gallico. So the book of the Gallic Wars from Julius Caesar, he actually mentions serving when is uh, when he was uh, uh, victorious in the Gallic Wars, serving uh, this Mamertino wine to his guests. So we start getting the notion of wine trade across the empire as the empire expanded, across the borders. And this led to certain changes. This led to certain discoveries. This led to certain creations of typologies of wines uh, that we will enjoy today. So if we take Marcus Aurelius as the base theme and we look at the Roman Empire at the height of Marcus Aurelius, we see that we pretty much encompass the entire Mediterranean basin, containing still to this day some of the most, if not the most, famous and important wine-growing uh, regions or countries in the world. All of Italy, France, Spain, uh, Greece, of course. So we have the capability now of understanding that we can source wines and enjoy wines that have a tie to the ancient Roman Empire coming from a series of different origins, which in turn will give us a series of different profiles. Before we get to this part, or at least the highlight uh, of this evening, let's rewind a little bit back previous to Marcus Aurelius. Early in the Roman Empire, the Romans were focused really much only on the coastal part of central Italy. To the north of them, they had the Etruscans that gave the name to Tuscany. Very important, very, very important wine makers and grape growers. And further north, we had the Celtic tribes. Yes, for those of you who don't know, Celts are not only insular Celts, the ones in the British Isles, but they were also the Chiselpine and Transalpine Gauls. So the Gauls of France and northern Italy. And it was Julius Caesar, at a certain point, that after the expansion of the Roman Empire that began conquering, firstly, all of the Italian peninsula, and then reaching you know, the Celtic tribes up north, it was Julius Caesar and the Gallic Wars that really started the expansion of wine across the Italian peninsula borders. Um, the Gallic Wars culminated, obviously, with uh, the uh, victory over uh, Vercingetorix, the uh, Gaulish uh, chieftain who uh, withstood uh, Roman expansion for a long, long time and was a fierce warrior, and he finally threw down his arms and was captured, arrested, and taken to Rome as a trophy of war. But the expansion of Julius Caesar's campaign in the Gallic Wars also expanded wine. It was then that wine was introduced beyond the Alps in what was chisel transalpine gall. So the vine was introduced into France, uh, wine uh, production was introduced into France, and then so on and so forth across the empire. And this brought about changes. It brought about changes in the way that the grapes were grown, the way the vines were trained. It brought about changes in the way the wine was made or aged or stored that Vari created variations in profile, in taste profile. 
It also mutated the grapes and the varietals as they were moving across the empire, encountering different environments, encountering different soils. The grapes would mutate, the DNA would change throughout you know, the, the centuries and become something different, something that we have today. And it was indeed this expansion that really started setting forth the notion of wine trade across the empire. And with wine trade across the empire, everything going out and then everything coming back in to the capital of Rome, we start seeing a very sped up evolution in wine styles, in grapes, uh, and in wine making even. Uh, indeed, we uh, uh, know from uh, Julius Caesar, as we mentioned before, that wine from Sicily, Mamertino, this town in Sicily, was brought up all the way into uh, Chisel Pine Gaul to celebrate, into France, to celebrate his victories. But also, uh, we have a, a, a notion of a switch in um, wine-making style. Because when the Romans arrived in Chisel Pine Gaul in northern Italy, they encountered for the very, very first time something extremely important. They found that the Gauls over there were tall, industrious, skilled in producing excellent wine, which they stored in wooden barrels as large as houses. This was written by Strabo, or Strabone in Italian, right? So Strabo wrote that indeed they encountered the Gauls storing their wine, not in clay amphora, which was the way that the Romans would have done, but in barrels made out of wood. The raw material over in, the, in, in, in that place was wood. The largest raw material available was, would have been wood of various typologies, from chestnut to oak uh, and, and so forth, elm. And that's the material that they would use to create these containers. So it's there in northern Italy that for the first time we encounter the use of oak for wine. Very important, very, very important because it alters the profile. This is an ancient uh, Gaulish uh, flask with uh, written Winum Naxum. So this is the name of someone that's, be, that's gifting this Winum or wine from Naxos, Naxum, which is a city in Sicily. So again, we start seeing this expansion of wine taking place. Not only do the winemaking techniques change, the grapes start mutating and change. They encounter certain native varietals growing around the empire that they incorporate into the winemaking, but also viticultural techniques change. Uh, the Arbustum Gallicum is a, is a clear example, uh, a type of a vine training technique uh, of growing vines tied to trees very, very high up. That alters the profile too, creates wines with higher acidic uh, content creates wines with certain different taste and flavor profiles. So wine really starts shifting away from that typical Roman falernum, amphora, diluted, spiced, sweetened, you know, to something different, to more flavors, more variety in terms of wine profiles and of grapes as well. And most importantly, we start seeing the use of oak for the very first time. Uh, we know today that oak is widely used in, in, in winemaking, in modern winemaking, and it's used not only to age the wine in a specific way through oxygen exposure, but also to impart flavors. So that would have been the first time in history that we start seeing wine gaining oaky flavors, or these spicy vanilla uh, oak-mandated uh, um, aromas and aromatics in the wines. So. Very exciting because it gives us the possibility to really look at the entire Roman Empire during Marcus Aurelius as a market of export and import of wines in all their different profiles. Thank you.